Welcome to K-Drama School. I'm your host, Grace Jung, and class is now in session. was written by Min Hyo Jung. She didn't write a lot of shows actually. Um, just prior to Full House, she wrote a kind of like it's a, it's a drama that did okay. It's called Oktapan Koyangi, also called called uh, Cat on the Roof. It starred um, Jung Da Bin and uh, Kim Ne Won. Uh, unfortunately, Jung Da Bin um, passed away uh, due to suicide, which. It's it's a common thing among Korean performers, and it's very very sad. But um, so that is how she passed. In any case, um, Min Hyo Jung wrote the screenplay Full House, which aired one year after Oktapan Koyangi. Full House was directed by Pyo Min Su. He directed a show called um, Worlds Within, which also features Song Ye Kyo, and it's a very very different kind of show. Uh, he also um, directed The Producers which features uh, Kong Yoo-jin, one of my favorite um, K-drama actresses, and um, Cha Tae-yeon, right? And Kim soo yeon of course. And IU, my gosh, star-studded kind of show. Full House is a really interesting kind of show that presents domesticity. Um, I feel like the show is arguing that domesticity, Korean domesticity, is shaped by Korean patriarchy. Like, at the start of the show, you see the the beautiful house that um that Jiun lives in, right? Han Jiun, played by Song Ye-kyo. She's living in this gorgeous house with big picture windows. She has this beautiful view of the ocean. There's a little small garden outside of her um just outside from her window. And it's a huge house, but it's a mess, right? There's like food wrappers everywhere. There are clothes strewn all over the place. And uh, Song Ye-kyo is sitting at her desk. She's on her, she's at her computer. And, you know, she has pigtails, she has glasses, and she's, like, typing away. She's got this, like, frantic, frazzled writer's kind of look. I think Marianne Doan wrote about it, about the the girl who wears glasses. Like, she's supposedly the unattractive female, right? And the curly, frazzled hair is also, like, an unattractive female character quality. But, like, I mean, she's played by Song Ye-kyo. So, I mean, Song Ye-kyo is, like, drop-dead gorgeous. So it kind of, like... Undo- it's it's attempting at that kind of um, pers- like character type, but it's hard to really convince the viewer that she's an unattractive person, right? They do kind of construct her as this sort of out of sorts. She's a bit of a mess, like not quite put together type of uh, character. Um, Han Ji and she lives by herself in this enormous house. We don't know how she supports herself, but we do know that her father built this house. He also passed away along with her mother in a car accident when she was very young. And Han Ji is very infantilized on this program. Like she doesn't appear to know anything about the outside world. She literally grew up inside a glass house like a display case like like a good for nothing barbie doll but her two so-called best friends uh they're deep in debt they're also pregnant so what they do is they tell her that she wants some kind of trip to china and that it's all expenses paid they book her a first class ticket they tell her that there are people like tourists there i mean a tour guide waiting for her there um that she's going to be put up at a really nice hotel but when she gets there, there's like none of that. Nobody's there. Also, while she's in China, the the these so-called best friends, they sell her house. Uh, they get rid of all of her belongings. They scrape out her savings account, like rob her blind. During that first class flight trip to China, she happens to be sitting next to Yi Youngjae, this asshole kind of actor type played by by P. When Yi Youngjae and Han Jian return to Korea, they get married out of like for contractual purposes. Uh, Yi Youngjae wants Han Jian to make his childhood crush jealous. And the terms are that Han Jian can live with him in his house. Uh, she has to cook and clean for him, which he will pay her, like compensate her with like a small salary. And uh, the terms are that Han Jian will get the house upon their divorce. 
her only um con like condition is that like she is not allowed to speak on their contractual marriage. So like Han Jin is there, like she's always cooking, she's always cleaning. It's this constant thing. Throughout the episodes, you see Han Jin like waking up super early to make Yeongje breakfast, and a Korean breakfast has a lot of elements to it, right? You have to make the rice, you have to make soup, you have to make the panchan. It's it's a huge thing, and he insists on having. Pop for breakfast. He wants rice for breakfast. He doesn't want to just have toast and eggs. Like he's like, no, nah, like that's not good enough, right? She's always wiping down those enormous windows. She's always mopping. She's washing dishes. She's constantly conducting housework. Meanwhile, you see Lee Young Jae lying around on his couch in delight. He's like making demands. He's yelling at her all the time constantly nagging her berating her he calls her stupid he calls her a chicken um and thank god like he doesn't say chicken head because that's got a whole nother connotation in english and han jian does all this work begrudgingly it's very clear from her facial expressions the things that she says that housework does not come naturally to a woman it is not fulfilling right um it's not something women enjoy it's hard labor and it's repetitive, okay? It's labor worth being compensated for because it's very demanding. Hence the 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 hourly fee that Youngjae offers her. And the house that she gets to keep at the end of the contract is also compensation for her hard labor. So Full House does have a very subtle feminist critique embedded in there. What's also clear is that Han Jian never felt the need to be domestically laborious until she started living with a man. Before Youngjae started making demands that she cook a huge breakfast for him every morning at 7 a.m., you know, before he started complaining about how messy the house is and Han Jian had to like, you know, do all this cooking and cleaning, she had a pretty chill life. As we've seen from episode one, the house was a mess and she was perfectly happy living in that mess, eating instant foods all the time. Also, Han Jiun is starting to develop a career as a writer, like a screenwriter. She needs to produce a synopsis for her boss like every single week. It's very demanding. And she can't always meet the deadlines on top of Young Jae's domestic demands at the same time. There's a pretty strong suggestion that a working woman who has domestic responsibilities have it very tough and that it's impossible to perfect both without exhausting oneself. In Professor Kathleen McHugh's book, American Domesticity from How-To Manual to Hollywood Melodrama, she writes the following. Housework is trivial, dull, stultifying labor, work only a woman in love or impoverished would willingly do, repetitive, strenuous, endless, infantilizing. And it, McHugh separates domesticity from housework, okay? While housework has these negative connotations built out of a feminist critique, domesticity has different associations. So this is what McHugh writes. She writes, domesticity by contrast refers to home, family, maternity, warmth, hearth, to the creation of a private place where we can be who we really are, to a set of experiences, possessions, and sentiments that are highly symbolically valued in our culture, right? So at the end of Full House, you see Han ji and Young-jae tidying up after a house party, right? Together as a couple, they're fighting over who's going to clear the table, right? It's safe to say that Han ji went from houseworker to a domestic woman after getting remarried to Young-jae out of mutual love and respect. Whereas in the first... Um, in the first like 15 episodes, it wasn't quite like that. Also, Young Jae got a taste of his own medicine when he moved into Han Jian's house post divorce because he had nowhere else to go. And uh, so he agreed to cook and clean for Han Jian now that she's a big shot screenwriter and he's at her mercy, right? Because his the film that he was in flopped and his career is marred by scandal and all this shit. So there's one scene when Han Jian's eating cookies on the, on the couch. And while Young just wiping the floor, you see her cookie crumbs falling onto the floor, right? And the camera is like very low. It's like down eye level to him on the floor. And she keeps dropping crumbs. He keeps wiping it. And then she drops crumbs again, rewipes it. And then eventually he just blows his stack out of frustration. You know, he thinks she's being so inconsiderate. He thinks she's doing it on purpose. And she's not. She's just eating cookies. That's all she's doing. But it's an, it's an important learning lesson for Young Jae, right? As a man. 
and for him to see what kind of demands he put on Han Jiun at all times, to routinely clean up after him, which was annoying as hell, and that that cleaning up is an endless thing. As long as there are people living there, you will always have to clean, and it's very routine, it's very repetitive, and it never ends. So in this sense, Full House has a very empathetic framing of the houseworker as well as the working woman who has domestic responsibilities, but it also glamorizes. I think it glamorizes domestic achievement and heteronormative coupling as the end game. Full House would have been a very different show in the end if Young Jae just like went away completely, and Han Ji Eun just returned to her pigsty life back at her house, and she's a successful screenwriter. And it almost did have that ending, by the way. And then Young Jae had to move back in, make his Weasley return. In fact, Han Ji Eun became the glue that patched up Young Jae's familial. Structure back together, like especially because Young Jin and his father have a very strained relationship, because his father is a doctor. He's an overly patriarchal, violent kind of man, and Jin has this gap in her own life where she lost her parents. She's an orphan, and so Young Jin's family fills that gap for her. Ultimately, this can even be read as Jin wanting Young Jin. Solely for his parents and grandmother in her life, right, to make up for the loss that she endured. Young Jae just becomes a catalyst for her to get to that achievement, to to gain back a family that she lost. But of course, there's love as well. Hence, this is a romantic comedy. Han Ji Eun is played by Song Ye Kyo. Right, she was so young back then, little lady, only 23 years old, so young. And Song Ye Kyo has a pretty interesting career. She started out as a commercial model in her teens. And then her TV career actually began in sitcoms. A lot of people don't know this, but I grew up watching her in this sitcom called Hengjin. Like a lot of people from her generation of acting began in sitcoms. You don't have a lot of Korean sitcoms these days, but、um, quite a few people started out in sitcoms. Like Song Seung-eun, he started out, you know, in a sitcom called Nam Jae Hit, Yo Jae Hit. That was hugely popular. If you're about my age and you're Korean, Korean American, you know what I'm talking about. And then Song Seung-eun and you know Song Ye-go, they both left the sitcom world in order to do a melodrama, right? Called、uh, Kail Dongha or Autumn in My Heart, came out in the year 2000.、Uh, and what a depressing show that was. I was at the peak of my adolescence at the time, and people my age who grew up watching Korean dramas are all probably frozen in a state of depression because of that show. Like it is so messed up. The screenwriter was brutal to the characters in that drama. I don't know why. It, like they just, she just didn't give the protagonists a break. Song Ye Kyo did another very heavy drama called All In in 2003, opposite Lee Byung Hun, and she was briefly engaged to him, but they broke up. I love Song Ye Kyo because、um, her performance in Full House is like. You know, you could really see her flexing her comedic muscles on that program, which she honed during her sitcom days, and she did some like very melodramatic performances in the years prior to this. You know, they were very heavy, so it was really great to see her be playful on a show like Full House. Song Ye Kyo was also pretty famous for dating like her、um, co-stars, right? Like she almost married Lee Byung Hun. And thank God she didn't, because I mean she almost got syphilis. Most likely already got it. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know if he's been on that syphilis. He most likely doesn't, but I'm pretty sure he has some other things. He's very slutty looking. What can I say? He looks slutty and evil. That's that's just my opinion. She dated her co-star Hyun Bin. Okay, yes, they dated. Can you believe that? They dated after they starred in that show Worlds Within together. They were playing、um, drama PDs actually. My goodness, yeah. Then Song Ye Kyo married her co-star、um, Song Joong Ki from Descendants of the Sun, right? And it's too bad that marriage did not last. I was very shocked when I first heard that they were dating, and then I was even more shocked when I heard that they were separating. It was like very, very shocking news for me. I I really dig、um, Korean star goss. I do. I'm into it. And I think I think it's pretty tough being the most beautiful woman in Korea. A lot of people say it's Kim Tae Hee, but I am Team Song Ye Kyo all the way. It's just I grew up with her. What can I say? Speaking of Kim Tae Hee, we all know her current husband who plays Young Jae, right? P, also known as Rain. Okay, P and Song Ye Kyo were very young in this drama. They were just kids. Their faces are still dripping with baby fat. It's adorable. Full House is not P's first drama. He was in a really weird melodrama called Sangdu. Let's go to school. 
uh, opposite Kong Hyo Jin in 2003. I liked P's performance in Full House a lot. I felt like he and Song Hye-kyo had great comedic chemistry together. Um, they don't have, they didn't have a lot of range on that show, honestly, but I would, I would say that that's the screenwriter's fault. It's like literally every single episode of that show, there are 16 episodes, but like 15 of them, it's about the, the, the peak conflict is like one of them is being kicked out of the house or like packing up their bags to leave the house because they can't stand being in each other's presence. It's really ridiculous. I was like, can you just kind of think outside the box? for a second and come up with a different form of conflict. It's so annoying. Today we're going to talk to one of my favorite LA performers. Her name's Natisha Anderson. And you've seen her on Maria Bamford's Netflix TV show called Lady Dynamite. You also saw her on Nickelodeon's All That. You've seen her on CSI. She was also in a TBS comedy series called Angie Trebekah. And Natisha's not only a really great actress, but she's a hilarious stand-up comedian. And she's also a very well-trained professional clown. Like, I mean, she's got some clown stories. I learned so much about clowning from Natisha whenever we talk about it. And I'm very excited to speak with her. So let's talk to Natisha Anderson. Are we doing it? Is it doing it time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. I'm good. I'm, I feel uh, I have a lot to be grateful for. That's nice. That's yeah. a good feeling to have. Yeah, I've somebody gave us these matching pajama onesies. Oh, wow. And I've never been the person who's like, let's get matching clothes. And somebody gave us these matching pajama onesies. And they're so like they're so big, the crotch comes to your knees <laughs> on it. And it has a hood. So it's like a big like potato bag. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> I'm that lady now. I'm like, Oh, you're so cute in your matching pajama. Like, <laughs> you're so cute. I'm that lady now. And I never in my life, I made fun of that lady. And now I'm that lady. You're talking about uh, Korean dramas? Korean TV shows? <laughs> yeah, some kind of. Yes and no. Um, okay, that's yeah. awesome. That's like perfect. I, I, I saw I saw the, what you're doing and I was like, oh my gosh, yes. This is so like good for you. And you're like the queen of this. <laughs> yeah yeah i figured i'll just i'll just do this why not i mean it's not like i have any job prospects you know it's funny like when i when i was graduating from college in 2009 i graduated into a recession and then this year i'm graduating into a pandemic so it's like yeah i don't know what's with me on schooling yeah. <laughs> you know yeah but you did it you hung in there and now you're you do doctor doctor uh I guess I'm going to be in yeah! June. <laughs> Dr. Grace, you need like a Dr. Grace like party or something or a Dr. Grace party yeah. or like when you do stand up, you should be announced as Dr. Grace. Always, <laughs> always be Dr. Grace. Yeah. I don't know about that. I, I think that would sound too weird. I don't know if I could handle it. If somebody right. called me like Dr. Jung, like I, I think that'd be so weird. Like when I graduated college, like I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Like, did you think it was that big of a deal when you graduated? Um, uh, I'm the first person in my family to get a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so for that aspect, it was a big deal. And I was like, yeah. And I, I, I was so ready to get out of there, too, that I was mm. like, let's just get, like, my diploma is, like, in a box somewhere. You know, like, I don't care. Right. Like, I'm so, I was so ready to, like, be done, like, get it and get out, you know? Uh -huh. And then last minute, we have this stupid writer's comp exam mm -hmm. that everybody has to take. And the last minute I found out I didn't pass. The day I took it, I'm a good writer! But the day <laughs> I took it, it was like thunderstorm, like flash flood warnings. Oh, God. Like, and I raced to this building and like, it was just like, the whole day was just a nightmare. Oh. And I guess I didn't pass it. <gasps> yeah, it's like a written essay. So I had, I had like, you know, like A grades and um, I can get into grad school grades. Yeah. And then uh, I, because I failed the writer's comp, I had to go back and retake it. And yeah. I retook it, it was fine. Yeah. So, so that was a little stressful. So I was just like, well, am I really going to graduate? Because it's dumb, right? So I don't like standardized tests. You know, I'm <laughs> the test make me anxious. And like, <laughs> Not like standardized test, and it wasn't standardized, but it was just like everybody's required to take this stupid writing comp. Like, what have we been doing? Yeah, like, I agree. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know why universities do that. I know so many people who are like that. Like, 
s- mm-hmm. somebody who had like literally one credit dangling mm-hmm. and th- they couldn't get through to administration and be like, look, this doesn't count. Like I, I'm a straight A student, my major, my department, like they, they know I'm, gr- I'm a great student. Um, this one thing and you can't just overlook it. And they're like, no, you're, you're not going to get your diploma. And it's like, they spent like, tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars going to that fucking school and they're gonna fucking hold that shit over them that's so messed up i've seen that happen so many times and it's ridiculous i agree education so expensive too like it is it is like it's my husband just went back to grad school and he went to his school's like one of the cheapest grad schools like in Mm -hmm. the nation but a great film school but a great film school. Yeah, they only took 14 people. I'm going to brag on him. <laughs> yeah, it's a great um, school. Yeah. Yeah. But he, but it's like looking at financial aid stuff. It's like, I, I don't know. I just can't. I can't. And it took me forever, like, to pay off my my school loans. Yeah. And, like, we sued my dad over it. Yeah. Like, it, like, it, like, because I didn't grow up around my dad, but he was, like, ordered to pay half of it. And then he didn't. And we went to court and we lost. And it was, like, this oh, whole. Oh, my God. Yeah, drama, drama. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what we're here talking about. <laughs> yeah. I'm so anxious about these. I do. Yeah. Do you like teaching? Um, I do. Uh, I think teaching is very difficult. I don't think it's something that comes naturally to me. I have to work at it very much. And um, when I first started TA, I was the worst. Like even I would have hated me, you know, like I hated myself TAing. I I was like very afraid of the students. I was intimidated by them. Um, I felt very little, I had very little confidence in myself and my abilities. And uh, so all of that just is a recipe for disaster. So my first TA ship went poorly. And then you know, as the quarters, as the years progressed and as I did more TA ships, I I figured out a way to improve a little bit each time, but I think being able to master teaching takes a lifetime. I don't think it's something that comes overnight. Did you have some good teachers yourself? Did I have good teachers? Uh, gosh, yes. I had a, uh, uh, yes. The answer is yes. Um, I had a first, I think I had a clown teacher who was great. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about clowning. Can you talk yeah, about I that? Yeah. Uh, uh, intensive with Itor Bazaar. Bazari. Bazari. Okay. Uh huh. And um, um, he's amazing. Probably like one of the best teachers I've ever had. Like, huh. so good. And um, yeah, it was just a week, but it was like all day and, mm-hmm. and late. And, um, I feel like clown is also a weirdo thing that it's like, I feel like it's like this weird, like ethereal, like we're not really going to explain it. You got to kind of figure it out for yourself, but he mm. does explain it. You mm. still figure it out for yourself. Does explain it in the best way I've heard, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I'm very like practical and I like, I like, like, this is a recipe. This is how you do it. This is a list of things to do. You know, like, I like very practical. Like, this is how things are explained. Right. And that whole, like, wishy-washy, like, oh, you know, it's like, you got to find your own. Like, I understand, like, find your own voice and find yeah. your own clown. But at the same time, it's like, I feel like I've paid so much money and nobody can really explain this. And I feel like it's almost like this game they're playing where they're like, you know, oh, you got to figure it out, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Tell me so I can explain it so I can apply. And I know, like, clowns get out of your head. I don't, brr, I don't know. <laughs> what What made this teacher a good teacher? Like, uh, dares you in ways you don't think you're being dared. Like, we did this whole thing where the class had, like, they had this huge, like, jump rope. And everybody had to jump in and out of the rope and stuff. And it was, a- and, like, it was actually scary because I w- didn't realize how, like, oh, I don't know how to jump rope. I was like, why are we doing this? And then it was like, oh, look, I just accomplished something I didn't think I could accomplish. Okay, uh... you, got me, you got me, you know. Okay. And, like, we wore costumes the entire time. Like, I was a spider for a week. Uh-huh. And you could w- do whatever. You chose spider? Yeah, well, I happened to have a spider costume, okay. you know, as you do. As you, as you what do. was the purpose of that? Just to kind of get you out of your head and just to, um, yeah, because you weren't, you weren't exploring 
the character you don't explore it's you it's not a character uh-huh it's always you uh-huh so you weren't like exploring a character you weren't mm-hmm. like, on a costume to put it on a character mm-hmm. but i think it was like just to like i don't want to say humiliation but mm-hmm. like in a way to get beyond yourself hmm. you know because it's like i look ridiculous mm-hmm. in a spider costume mm-hmm. like get over yourself you know yeah get up get up beyond yourself yeah a lot of times in clown um they beat you up like huh. they can be so mean to the point where you cry you know huh. like who the the your peers or the, the teacher, teacher. Oh. the teacher yeah yeah um so but i feel like he was rough but in no means was anybody gonna cry and if mm. you cry it was okay you know but he wasn't he wasn't that extreme he was like let's just play and have fun versus mm-hmm your shit you need to feel like shit and then you can find your clown hmm yeah you know? i think Which there's I- a lot of that like among especially with acting yeah. like acting coaches like they kind of aim to break you down mm-hmm. and there's a purpose behind it but it's also a bit violent like there's definitely the whole um how do you say the whole concept of like fil- male film directors breaking their actresses yeah. you know taking them to the to the brink like they did yeah. with them like Lars von Trier did with Bjork for instance you know like turned her off acting forever you know mm-hmm. and uh yeah there's that whole thing I don't know what what it is with that Hitchcock what's did that didn't Hitchcock he? definitely did that a lot of a lot of directors Kubrick yeah all yeah. the so-called greats yeah and I don't understand it because I feel like it's so like uh like i think the dp needs just as much like mm. dp is just as important as directors oh I think, huge you know? huge and i feel like it's uh it's a uh uh, uh it's a team it's a team yes yeah. yes i think there's this emphasis on the so-called auteur and yeah. that that's why the weight goes on the director the male director the filmmaker yeah. the the auteur and you know that that theory has been debunked time and time again especially among cinema scho- scholars you know like as we all as anybody knows who's worked in the industry they know that filmmaking is does not come from just the director come, yes. every single person mm-hmm. involved has a huge you know weight to them like you say the dp the editor oh my god the editor brings so much um mm-hmm. the and the actors themselves also can function as auteurs. So, yeah, it's, um, I think the romanticization of the director, the filmmaker, the great man filmmaker, I think that has sort of, um, yeah, placed emphasis on the director and given them this status that they don't really own, to be honest. Or ego, too. <laughs> like, so many of them, it's like, oh, ego, like, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah, it's it's funny because like I've I've done um, some TV and commercials and stuff, mm-hmm. and I think I've had I've only had one female director. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've had ads first ads, but yeah. one female director on a TV show like, mm. ever. and yeah, and then I had a female director on a web series, mm-hmm. and I don't think I've ever had a commercial female director ever ever. Mm. Yeah. How did you get into clowning? I mean, I know that you you're from Indiana. That's where you were born yeah. and raised. Yeah. And then you wanted to get into show business. So is that when you just moved straight to LA, or was there some in between place? I so I uh, started it with dancing. I danced forever. I, da- I danced forever, and then um, I started doing um, improv in high school, and I did musical theater in high school and then uh i went to ball state university Uh and at ball state it was like you had to decide you had to audition for your major and i was like oh do i do musical theater or do i do straight acting and i decided i never was a great singer Uh and um so i decided you know i'm just gonna do and also i just i enjoy acting the most i Uh think um yeah 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 and i'm short so it's like i don't not really the body not the best chorus girl you know (laughs) i'm real short not the best chorus girl real short you know (laughs) and so i was like okay uh, i'll do yeah and i just liked acting better so i went did acting i majored in acting in college and in college i had a uh i did a semester of commedia dell'arte which is the mass clown Uh 
and I cried like every other day and it was like one of the hardest classes I've ever taken. It was so hard. And then I had a professor who was like, you should do go to LA because you're a weirdo. You're quirky. <laughs> It's like, that's great. That's great. You know, so you go to like, yeah, New York and try to be a chorus girl all your life, but well, sure, you know, so I was like, <laughs> okay. So I was like, uh, so I came to LA and then I did, uh, a bunch of, a bunch of improv, mm -hmm. bunch of improv. Where? Uh, well, I did classes, I did Groundlings, mm -hmm. uh, iOS, mm. comedy sports. I was on like three improv teams at one time. Mm -hmm. I was working a full time job mm. and I cried in my car a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was just like really frustrated. And then my therapist, I was pursuing acting at the time. Mm -hmm. I'd done like, I did like a, I did a McDonald's Super Bowl commercial. That's and huge. Then, well, yeah, it was. But then I moved to a different agent and like nothing happened. Hmm. And then I like, it was just, I don't know. I cried a lot in my car. My therapist was like, this is a lot for you. Maybe you just focus on stand up. Cause I was just starting stand up at the time too. Mm. And I was like, okay, you're probably right. She's like, write down your feelings, break up with everything and just focus on stand up. It's just like, I'm just doing, I broke up with my improv teams. I was like, I'm just going to do stand up. Mm -hmm. And then I did that for like six or seven years, just doing stand up. Mm-hmm. And then my, uh, this is a long story. This is more than you asked for. No, my okay. uh, now acting manager, mm -hmm. I was hosting a show at the Improv Lab. Mm -hmm. And he was there and he was like, hey, he was a theatrical agent at the time. He's like, I'd like to represent you. And I was like, that would be great. Mm -hmm. so he got me back into acting and he changed my life and I adore him and I'm still mm -hmm. with him. So yeah, he's now a manager. So he was a theatrical agent. He left and I was the manager. He took mm -hmm. me. And adore him, adore him. And um, stand up is uh, very aggressive. And stand up is like you five minutes, you get up there, you're like, here's joke, 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 joke. You know, right. and you're almost teaching. You're telling the audience, hey, this is the rhythm. Set up, laugh. Set, up, you know, you're right. telling this is the rhythm. This is how we do it. Mm -hmm. Where clown is a lot more slower, and it's more like I'm going to make eye contact with everybody, make sure we all feel safe. Okay, <laughs> now. Oh, I'm gonna do something. Did you yeah. see that? Did you, did you like it? You, so it's more uh, exploratory. Yeah, it's a different energy. Uh huh. And I think there are elements of clown to put into stand up for sure. Um, I didn't know that you were hosting a show at the Hollywood Improv's The Lab. What show was that? It was just a one-off show. Um, Brett Gilbert, my friend Brett Gilbert, brought me in to host it. Oh, that's so. great. It was his show. I don't remember the name of it, but uh -huh. it was his show. It was just a stand-up show, like a showcase? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so. great. And um, I felt like I bombed so hard that night. Like, I, <laughs> I just, it was so funny because I was like, oh, gosh, this is rough, you know? <laughs> like, I remember going backstage to Brett and be like, oh, I'm sorry, more, you know? <laughs> What day of the week was it? Do you remember? Oh, it was like a weekday. I don't know. Tuesday <laughs> or Thursday, baby. I just felt like they were not with me. And because I didn't think, I felt like they weren't with me. So I was like, oh, we're going weird real fast. We're going hard. <laughs> I was like doing songs in the middle of like, I just, I don't even know what I was doing. I was just like, okay, you're not yeah. on board. So I, I don't, I, uh, I tried. I kind of love those kinds of atmospheres, though, as intimidating as they are. Like, uh -huh. it's it's similar to how these um, teachers of yours brutalized you and made you, like, and emphasize, like, get over yourself. The lesson here is get, o get the fuck over yourself. And, like, the lesson in stand-up, like, that's our teacher. Like, with stand-up comedy, yeah, like, some people take classes. I've never personally taken classes. Um, but, like, I... I feel like that's the greatest teacher when the room is so dead and it's so empty and it's so late and it feels like all hope is lost. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And those are the nights like, you know, I like I got passed at the improv, but those are the nights that I get booked, you know, like midnight after midnight, like 1245 a.m., 1 a.m. on a Thursday or the day after new year's like you know like those days or christmas eve you know yeah. and it's like 
there's nobody there but there are people there there are some people there and it's like and then there's the back of the room like like the the sound guy and the host you know like they're your audience and it's like okay it's super late what do i do you know yeah. and then it's like when you win those people there's no greater feeling yes yes right? and i think those people are there like they are yes. still paying money they still are there you know and i've yes. seen so many comics like crap on the audience, the small audience, and be like, "Why are you guys here? I don't want to be." And it's like, no, we're here. I'm like, embrace them more, coddle them, like, yeah, each other. You know, exactly. Like those are the people that are like, you know, that's the room to work. I feel like, and I love those kinds of rooms. Like even at like Flappers, um, you know, like it's like a Tuesday night, mm -hmm. 10 p.m. You know, there were literally like 12 comics that just went up before me. Most of them sucked. Yeah. And then, and, and like about half of those comics yelled at the audience, right? And then it's like, I'm up. What do I do? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. that's an opportunity. That's a fucking opportunity to like win the people that the other guy just lost, you know? Yeah. I love those moments, you know, I love them so much. And they're the best teachers because it's literally like, okay, all hope is lost. The, the ship has sunk. All right. Everybody went down with it. Uh -huh. What do we do? How can we salvage it? You know, yeah. I yeah. love that so much. Yeah. That situation too. You learn that people appreciate differently. Yes. Like I heard a comic once say like audiences appreciate differently. Yeah. And I had a show one time. Oh gosh. It was the first show before I was married my in-laws saw me do, I was hosting for Bill Dwyer oh. and uh, the whole front row was not having it. And they were mm. so quiet wow. and I was like, oh, this is, and my in-laws were there and I was like, this is not going well, you know? <laughs> and um, they just were not having it. And I was just like, so are you guys a group? Or are you together? And they were yeah. like, yeah, it's a Christmas party for a group of therapists. <laughs> So they're not going to be yelling. They're going to be like, mm hmm. Oh, I understand. Oh, funny. funny. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, you know what I'm saying? A group of therapists. They're not going to be screaming and laughing. They're going to be like, oh, my God. Oh, mm -hmm. that, was, that was concerning, but okay. That's, I can see the humor in that. At the same time, though, like, I don't know. Like, at least 60% of my act is about, like, my trauma. Own trauma and mental illness. And I was like, oh, this is a dance. And it was so fun. And I feel like I was just performing for them. And I yeah. laid on stage. I talked about all the self help books I've read. And like, like, I was just like, I just want your approval, you know. And yeah. you know, I'm like, approval. Like, like, we just. And I don't know if my in laws were on board. And like, I went to the back and go to the back, like, bring on first comic. Yeah. Uh, go to the back. And the, uh, I think there was a feature there and uh, 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 the headliner. And they were like, what is going on with them? <laughs> like, you were working it. You were working it. They yes. were just not. It was like, they're therapists. Yeah. They're so with you. They're just not going to hoot and holler. And that's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. It's like you had to coach the comics into understanding a therapist's reaction to comedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, it's okay. They're with you. You know, they're going to take it in, reflect. They're going to. You know, hear what you're saying. Oh, God. You know, they may not uh, be screaming and hootering and yeah. hollering, but they're so... But they're taking notes. Yes. Yeah, they're taking notes. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they'll have notes after the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, that's amazing. And oh, yeah, God. it's usually the front row that's the hardest. Oh, it was like 10 of them. Like, yeah. it had to be like a therapist office or something. Like, ten, they were like, this is our Christmas party. And, I, and they were like, probably like... You know, like fifties, maybe mid fifties. Oh wow, yeah, that's tough. Course, like they're not gonna, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that story. That's such a great. That's so meta. It's oh. like the most meta experience ever. <laughs> I love like in improv. There's this saying like "fall on the knife," hmm. you know, where it's mm -hmm. like, have you heard that? Where it's like, you know like a scene's going tanking or something or mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna go out there and i'm gonna murder myself and i'm gonna mm -hmm. fail and it's gonna hurt and i'm gonna humiliate myself but i gotta do it and i feel Get like into it. Stand up, there's that's there's just those shows where you're just like or even like i've seen audiences that just you know they don't like women you mm -hmm. know 
and it's like you see they're with the guy they're with the guy oh there's a girl mm, there's a guy there's a guy oh she's not gonna tell me anything i don't care you know right and then you get up there it's so it's true like it I is hate, yeah it happens and you know getting up there like this is i've had one show where i was like i need to make it to my car before this guy comes out of the show Ugh. you know yeah. just one show where i was like not very nice to him because i felt like yeah. <laughs> yeah i feel like i have a stupid I will say a stupid <sighs> confidence uh -huh. in sometimes a naivety. I don't know what you want to call it with okay. like I've said things to hecklers or rude audience members that I don't know if I would say if I wasn't on stage. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Of course. Like if I was just, and I've noticed that if I'm an audience member at a show. Yeah. I will aggressively get on and on a another audience member. Like I'll aggress. Yeah. You need to like I will shut them down yeah. as an audience member. You know. I know it's because we 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 know we're in the business and we know what that's like for the person on yeah. stage. I've seen I've seen that. I was at a Jim Jeffrey show in Seoul in Korea. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They would not stop heckling Jim Jeffries. And, you know uh -huh. Jim Jeffries stand up is long form. It's like long form storytelling. These people would not stop shouting things in the middle of his, he, he, like, maybe 25 minutes in, he just gave up doing the set that he was uh, working on. He started falling, he started doing only crowd work, like he mm. did crowd work for about 15 minutes. And then the closer, right, like the closer, the big finale that you're waiting for at every stand up show, right, the closing bit, he didn't do it. He just didn't, he recycled an old bit from like eight years ago that he did he just reused that which was mm -hmm. like i i'd say that's a big fuck you to the audience you know mm -hmm. it's like you paid what like 70 dollars to come and see me and i'm just gonna give you old recycled material that's been on hbo already that's probably on netflix and you could just look it up so yeah you've been a terrible audience like he didn't say it but mm -hmm. i feel like that was the, a fuck you to us you know mm -hmm. because the audience was just horrible mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's awful that's awful it yeah. is awful when like it's kind of like tennis etiquette you know <laughs> like like uh when you go to uh, watch tennis you're not supposed to clap when somebody faults and then oh, okay. the opposing side wins a point you're not supposed to clap you're supposed to clap when somebody like d takes a really great shot and then wins that point. That's when you're supposed to clap, you know? Um, there are moments yeah. when you should and shouldn't clap. Even in golf, there are all these etiquette, there's rules, right? Yeah. And I feel like with stand-up, there's some of that too, even though stand-up is like completely base, you know? But it's still performance, it's still theater. And mm -hmm. with theater comes etiquette. And it's like when people are stupid drunk, which is yeah. at every comedy club, right? When they're yeah. black, like blackout drunk and they can't, hold it together and they're shouting and heckling mm -hmm. being rude interrupting punch stepping on punchlines interrupting yeah. long form deliveries it's a nightmare mm -hmm. oh my gosh yeah mm -hmm. it's like bridal showers bri bridal parties yeah like they're loud and obnoxious they wanted to be about <laughs> them and it's like we're not here like you're yeah. here to be part of this like you know this yeah. audience yes Yes. Yes. So but it's like in those moments when you're the stand up, when you're the one on stage, that's when you got to fall on the knife yeah, and yeah. you got to be like, all right, well, fuck my material. It's not good. They're not going to have it. So we got to make yeah. it about them. And um, yeah. it's about being present. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. the I, I was talking to Will Hines a couple days ago. And, you know, that's what he talks about in his book. And that's what he teaches in his improv classes is like mm -hmm. the emphasizing the present. And, but I feel like being present in every moment as an artist is the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Like even when you're doing stand up, yeah, you have your, your act, you know, you have the material, but like if the people are not receptive to it, then mm -hmm. be present, adjust to the moment, adjust to them, make it about them and they're gonna laugh real fucking hard, mm -hmm. right? And then they're gonna have a great night. And even though you didn't say a single one of your jokes, they're still gonna love you because mm -hmm. you gave them a great time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about the experience. It's about the experience more than the jokes. Yes. Yes, it's about the experience. It's about being in this moment with them. And I, I love it because it's like this this moment only exists with this audience. This, this specific group of people in this time, in this moment, will never, ever exist mm -hmm. again. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like with yeah. these, 
specific audience members with you at this time, you know, mm-hmm. and it's influenced by who came on before you, who's mm-hmm. after you, you know, yeah. Like, what is the day of the week? Like what <laughs> happened politically today? You yeah. Know? It's all. Yeah. It's yeah. All We're all yeah. connected. Oh, that's so, that's so Buddhist. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's get into some flashcard questions. You ready? Oh, Whoa, okay. Yeah. So let's say you're a 20 something year old woman. Okay. You're an orphan, okay? You're also a novelist, all right? And you're trying to break into screenwriting, okay? But you have no assets, no money. Um, the only thing you have is a nice house to your name, which your father built for your family before he and your mother passed away in a car accident when you were a child, all right? Mm-hmm. But one day, your two best friends, um, they're a couple. They tell you that you want a, a free trip to China, okay? Um, but you get to China and you realize that the hotel reservation that they mentioned isn't there. There's no tourist company waiting for you. You're flat broke. You don't even have a plane ticket to get back home. What do you do? Uh, I call them and I say, please help me, friends. Can you send me money or can you help me to buy a plane ticket? What if they're not picking up? I mean, of course, that's what she does, but okay. they're uh, not picking up the phone. They're not picking up. Then I, uh, oh gosh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to strip just yet. I don't want to strip just yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm hold that off a little bit. Uh, I. Do I have any other friends I can call to help? It's weird. Uh, no. Oh, it's just gosh. these two friends. Yeah, very weird. No family. Oh. Not, not even distant relatives. Just no parents. No family. Okay. Just these are your friends. The only ones. Um, I... Uh, then I take a job as a nanny and live <laughs> with the family as a nanny... Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. To okay. save money and then get back but, home. Yeah, to go back. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's say you're the same woman. All right. Okay. You get back to your home in Seoul, but you realize that your friends stole your entire savings, and they sold your house to some asshole of an actor. You're a homeless oh. bum. What do you do? Uh, murder them. <laughs> murder them. Yes. I murder my friends. Okay. With a stick that I found on the road <laughs> and the lid of a, of a trash can that I found on the road. Okay. Very cost efficient. Doesn't, yes. doesn't break your bank. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And then I also murder the actor and move back into the house. <laughs> and I, I throw the bodies, I bury the bodies in the basement. <laughs> but I get a, uh, like a, I try to find like a bleach situation that'll like dissolve the bodies. Oh my God. <laughs> <Base it. Yeah. laughs> okay. All right. Murder. Very Sopranos. Murder. So you're still this broke homeless lady, but again you you meet this world famous actor okay in fact you met him on the flight to china okay? okay and when you guys are back in seoul he asks you to marry him in order to get back at a crush that rejected him in exchange he agrees that upon divorce he will give you back your house what do you do um i marry him mm-hmm I make sure there's a prenup in place mm-hmm. where I want to get my house. And mm-hmm. I'm also going to throw in some other treats in there, too. Like? I want a puppy dog. I want a golden doodle <laughs> dog. Uh, yeah. I need some boots. So I'll get some boots in there. <laughs> and then I marry him. And we try to work it out. We try to be like, hey, this could be a thing. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah, it could be a real yeah. marriage. All right. Yeah. But if it doesn't, yeah. you have your boots and your pup and your house. And my prenup, yeah. And then if I have to murder him, <laughs> I murder him to keep my house and get out of the prenup. Okay, yeah. you always have murder to fall back yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Let's say your fake husband took you out for a drive, a joyride, okay? okay. 
And he was going to buy you a birthday present because it's your birthday. He was going to buy you dinner. But uh-huh. his old crush calls him and mm-hmm. says she needs to see him immediately. So he drops you off in front of the mall and tells you to wait for him. And he goes to see her. What do you do? Um, well, I, could, did I take his credit card before he dropped me off? Strangely, no. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, no. Do I have money on me? I guess some. Not a lot. Okay. okay. I go drink by myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go drink by myself. I'm going to have an Auntie M's pretzel. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna have a cookie. I'm gonna have a Sally Fields cookie. Nice. Sally Fields, Sally Fields cookie. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm gonna drink by myself. Uh huh. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you would hit like the Ruby Tuesdays bar and then yeah. you would hit the food court. <laughs> yeah. And then after I'm well drank up, I would call the girl. I call yeah. the girl and I'd be yeah. like, "Listen, I murdered before. I murder you. I'm really you. I've done it before." Yeah, it's yeah. very easy. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd let her know to stay away from my man. My okay, fake, my fake man. Good. All right. Got to got to protect what's yours. Final question. Okay. Oh, that's fun. Okay. Now that your fake husband um, is unavailable. Right, because you're married to him. His old crush wants him. Oh, you know how bitches get. And she keeps calling him, and he goes to see her at her beck and call, like all the time. All right. Meanwhile, you're developing feelings for your fake husband. What do you do? I, uh, say, hey, fake husband. This is a thing. I, we have romantic times together with our golden doodle. And we like, oh, uh, we spend, I make sure that we have quality romantic time together. Uh-huh. And I try to explain to him, like, listen, she's only, we, she's bad news. We know she's bad. I try to, I try to reason. I start with hmm. reason. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Romance and reason. That's what I start with. So. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, if he's still like, oh, but I gotta call her back. Oh, but I wonder. Her name's Brittany. That's what I said. Yeah. I wonder how Brittany's doing. <laughs> then I uh, uh, say, oh, why doesn't Brittany come over? Why doesn't Brittany come over? And the two of us can, the three of us can have it out. Like I make it sound <laughs> sexy. And then Brittany comes over, and then I murder her <laughs> in front of him and the dog. Oh like, my god, the dog too. Yeah, and the dog, yeah. And uh, I then say, listen, buddy, you married me. You're locked in. Um, I was like, I was like, you either love me or you love the taste of death. What's it going to be? <laughs> and then he's like, he's like, oh, you're right. I loved you all along. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then he, because we got so many bodies in the basement. <laughs> yeah. He takes Brittany's body and throws it into the ocean. Uh huh. So he disposes of the body for me. So yeah. now he's like in it with me. Right. So yeah. And, and it's out of love, not out of fear. Right, right, right. Totally out of love. Yeah, yeah. He did that for me. Yeah. I love you as much as murder. Yes. Yes. That's yes. real love. That's deep yeah. love. <laughs> in a golden doodle. Yeah. Yeah. In All golden. right. That's great. That wraps up our flashcard series. Woo! Yeah, it was uh, so lovely talking to you, Natisha. Yeah, it's so good talking. We did it. Oh my god, we did it. I was nervous, but we got through it. It was fun. It's so good to see you. We did it. It was great seeing you. So we're gonna talk about Search WWW. It was a TVN drama that came out in 2019. It's a very underrated show. Very, very underrated TV series. Not a lot of people talk about it. But I think it's a really great show that's got a very strong queer energy to it. Um, It's very, very strong. It's not even a subtext. It's like the text is like this is a very like lesbian drama. I love it. It's got a very intense female same sex energy to it. It's got very strong like queer bull dyke energy to it. It's it's fascinating. I think it's a great show. As always, if you have questions for me, you guys, just email me, all right? 
email me. Reach out. Kdrama at gmail.com. So easy to remember. Okay? And then you could follow me on all the socials. Hello? You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram. You can follow me on TikTok. I have fun videos and things on there for you to look and check out. Okay? At Kdrama School. All the handles are the same. And then subscribe to YouTube. Yes, you can watch this podcast on YouTube. Hello? At Kdrama School. Look it up. It's there. I'm there. All right? And folks, if you haven't already, please leave a review. Right? Like, just go to Apple Podcasts. Just leave a five-star rating. Leave a little review. Say something nice. You know, whatever. If you learn something, you know, if you learn something you never knew before, just just say you you appreciate that I'm dropping some knowledge. If, if you laughed at something that went on in, in any of these episodes, just say, I laughed. It was funny. Say something nice. It's hard to say nice things. It's hard to say nice things about people sometimes. It takes effort. But let's get into the practice of saying nice things. And you can start with me and K-Drama School. So that is all for today. I really appreciate you. I will see you all next week.